Hi, uh, wish you all a very good morning. Uh, here I am still taking some classes to you uh, virtually. <clears throat> and this lecture comes to you on the topic of dental plaque. Uh, till we see you in physical form, uh, this is probably going to be the way we will learn our dentistry. I'm pretty sure uh, you all uh, would understand the compulsions that's uh, going around with the COVID times. Okay. Uh, my, uh, the very nature of this topic, uh, it's probably one of the most important topics you'll ever learn in dentistry. Uh, going by <coughs> the understanding, we have to understand that the reason why we have dentistry is because of plaque. The dental plaque is the whole and sole reason why we are in dentistry, why dentistry as a specialty exists. Okay, if there is no dental block, there is no oral biofilms, there is no bacteria inside the mouth settling on the surface of the teeth and causing so many problems, dentistry per se would not exist. Probably only two branches would exist, that would be orthodontics to set the teeth right, and probably uh, oral surgery or any surgical specialty to set the bones right if you have a trauma. But otherwise, dentists would not exist without dental block. <clears throat> Thanks to nature. Uh, thanks to the fact that uh, there is something called oral cavity, there is something called saliva, and there are something called a lot of oral bacteria, viruses, etc., uh, uh, which can stay in the mouth and on the surface of the teeth and the joining surfaces. Uh, the as a specialty exists, it obviously does employ all of us. The reason why we all have our bread, butter, and jam is because of dental plaque and nothing else. Okay, so understand uh, the importance of dental plaque, which is not just causing the dental diseases, but it's also giving employment to a lot of us. Uh, this is what I am, uh, uh, Dr. Kulkarni here. I don't know if you've met uh, physically uh, when the college was on and when the, we were in the non-COVID era, but yeah, that's what I am uh, here. So let's understand, what is plaque? The most important thing for all of you to understand uh, is the definition. If you probably understand the definition, it's very, very easy for one to go ahead and uh, what we call as um, you know, understand the entire topic in its entirety. Okay. So what's the definition of dental plaque? Uh, it goes like this. Plaque is defined as a highly variable but specific structural entity resulting from the colonization and growth of microorganisms of various species and strains which are embedded in an extracellular matrix. This is one definition that probably you will, you will have to remember at the back of your hand and you should probably be able to reproduce it in toto uh, as and when asked for because this would determine everything that we do in industry. So let's understand this. It's defined as highly variable. Highly variable means the plaque that you see on one surface of the tooth is entirely different than you see on the other surface of the same tooth. The plaque that you see in the subgingival environment and the supragingival is different. In the same patient, the plaque on 2-1 and 1-1 are both different. Okay? The bacteria which is there on 1-6 is different than what is there on 1-7. So that's the degree of variability. Apart from variation between two different individuals, etc., in the same individual, in the same mouth with different sites, we have different sets of bacteria. So it's highly, highly variable. It's literally uh, like India's population. Okay, variable population that we have. But it is specific structural entity. It may, what do we mean by this specific structural entity? It means that whether it looks like this or like this, but it's got a defined structure. What it means? It means that the plaque is not an amorphous substance. It is not floating in air or it is not floating on a water. Okay, it's a structure, it's something like, it's not a crystal, but it's got this defined structure. What the structure means? It's got something called as a matrix, then there has got colonies, and then there are bacteria. So it's got a different structure, though the bacteria and everything can vary from side to side or tooth to tooth, but yes, they have a different structure. So this structure is very, very important for the plaque to attach onto the surface of the tooth and for the plaque to survive, thrive, and then cause the diseases of what it causes. And how does it result? Structural entity. Resulting from the colonization and growth of microorganisms. So what it means? So it means that if I clean the entire surface of the tooth, all the teeth surfaces which I clean up completely, okay, and then I leave it open. 
in the saliva, in the mouth. Okay, so for example, I have a patient who walks into my clinic now. I do a scaling, group training, polish it up, put a mouthwash, do everything, and I leave the patient back without any uh, like that. Then what happens? You have to understand that the oral cavity is a very, very big reservoir. It's a very big reservoir for bacteria, viruses, and fungi. Okay, some of them are commensal, some of them are acquired. Okay, now what happens? Once you clean the surface of the teeth, the bacteria from the other areas of the oral cavity start coming and attaching. The other source of the bacteria to come in the mouth are environment. Okay, you drink water, you drink milk, you drink alcohol, probably whatever you take is going to cause uh, food. You have food, you have vegetables, everything can get the bacteria into your oral cavity. Okay, so these from out of all these bacteria that are there around the world. Okay, some of these bacteria have the ability to attach to the surface of the tooth. So that process of attachment of a particular bacteria or the microorganism onto the surface of the tooth is known as colonization. After the colonization, once the bacteria go and attach onto the surface of the tooth, what they do next? They multiply, they multiply. And as they multiply, they grow. So one bacteria can go into this one. Something like what's happening with coronavirus. If one person gets positive, uh, with the disease, he contacts more, so he's going to spread the virus to more and more people. Exactly in the same manner, whereas what's happening here is that one particular bacteria is going to multiply. And that's what is going to lead to the process of what is called growth of the microbial colonies. So the plaque is defined as highly variable, but specific structural entity, resulting from colonization and growth of microorganisms of various species and strains. So we have to understand that's not unibacterial. <clears throat> what do we mean by unibacterial? Now, for example, someone has typhoid. Now, what would you say someone has typhoid? It's a one single bacteria. Okay, so plasmodium is causing all the... If you don't have plasmodium, then the disease doesn't become typhoid. Understanding? Or if you say tubercle. Unless you have M mycobacterium tuberculosis, if any lung infection is there, it is not tuberculosis. Okay, so it's a multibacterial. Okay, various species. So you have species A, B, 2, Z, anything, species, multiple species of bacteria and different strains. In the same species, there are different versions. Now, you see the, uh, the recent one, the most popular right now is the coronavirus. And what's happening with the coronavirus? There are different strains. There are nine different strains of the same virus. So you have to understand the bacteria undergo certain small modifications, what we call as mutations. So it can have streptococcus. It's got, again, sanguis, mitis, Viridin, so many different types of streptococci. So the various species and strains which are embedded in extracellular matrix. I understand what is mean, the meaning of extracellular matrix? There is something it's like a meshwork. Without this meshwork, all these bacteria would be lying individually and they can be cleansed out very, very easily and faster. On the other hand, when they're embedded in a particular matrix, what's going to happen here? When they are embedded in a matrix, they're adherent. They're tight, held tightly in a, on the surface of the tooth, which cannot be easily dislodged. If otherwise, as normal brushing or even a th water, three way syringe water spray would dislodge everything. That doesn't happen. Plaque has to be mechanically taken out because the bacteria are embedded in extracellular matrix. So, <clears throat> if you understand this definition now of plaque as a highly variable but specific structural entity resulting from the colonization and growth of microorganisms of various species and strains, which I'm in extracellular matrix, then it's very easy for you to understand plaque <coughs> and remember this topic. Going further, let's classify plaque. How do we classify plaque? We classify plaque on its location. So let's put the schematics, yes. We classify plaque on the two bases, on the location. Number one, supragingival and subgingival. What do you mean by the word supragingival? All the plaque that's present coronal, Coronal to the gingival margin is supragingival, and all the plaque that's present apical to the gingival margin is subgingival. Now, supragingival plaque has been further classified, subclassified rather, as coronal, marginal, or fistral, and subgingival becomes tooth attached, tissue attached, and unattached. So, let's see here in this picture here. Okay, so what we see here in the supragingival on the right side, okay, the green is what we call coronal, the yellow is marginal, and blue is fistral. On the other hand, the subgingival plaque, the lilacish color is what we call as tooth attached. The bluish is what we call the tissue attached. 
and there is something called purple color in between the gingival uh, sulcus and the tooth surface, and that's what we call as unattached. So that's how you classify the plaque as a progingival plaque and subgingival. Depending upon causation, means what disease does the plaque cause, it can be classified as what we call as carious plaque and periodontal plaque. It's just an understanding that if you, the most of supragenital plaque is carious plaque, means the plaque that can cause, or the bacteria in the plaque can cause dental caries, or they cause dental caries rather. And on the other hand, periodontal plaque is that plaque which can cause or initiate periodontal disease. It can be simple gingivitis to very aggressive forms of aggressive periodontitis. So it can cause both. So next is how do we identify plaque? Clinically, so when a patient comes to me and sits on the chair, I see them and if I identify plaque, how do I identify plaque? The easiest way to identify the plaque is clinical evaluation. So what you do, you make the patient sit, you give them a glass of water to rinse out, whatever food debris, etc. are there. Once that's gone, then you take your mouth mirror and probe and then retract and then check. So what are we looking at? Then when we see this, we see something called as a whitish to yellowish pigmentation on the surface. So if this is the surface of the tooth and you see something like this whitish, then that's what we call as a whitish to yellowish pigmentation on the surface of the tooth. That is supragingival plaque. But you have to understand that everyone will not have this whitish to yellowish plaque. They can also have some different colors depending upon the kind of food they've had. For example, someone has eaten a lot of tomato or has eaten a lot of beetroot, then the plaque if there is there on the surface, it can start looking reddish or uh, dark uh, beetrootish color. Someone had a lot of green leafy vegetables, so it can look green. So the color of the plaque usually comes from the food pigmentations. On the other hand, we have to understand this clinically visible plaque is visible only if the amount of plaque is very, very abundant. If the amount of plaque that is present is minimal, then you do not you, at times you won't be able to see this plaque clinically directly with your naked eye. So that's when we go to the next step, what we call as identification of plaque. Okay. Where do we see plaque? <clears throat> we see plaque primarily. Clinically, every time I see a patient's mouth, I'm looking at plaque. And where am I looking at? I'm looking at the gingival margin. The initial part where the plaque starts forming along the surface of the tooth is along the gingival margin, then in the interproximal areas, and then on the buccal or the lingual surfaces. Usually plaque is more in anterior and posterior than anteriors, more on the lingual side and than on the buccal. One has to understand <clears throat> that if some patient has a lot of plaque on the occlusal surface or on the buccal surfaces or the labial surfaces, it means that, it means that this person's got a really horrible hygiene because otherwise the pressure from the lip and the tongue would probably clean out everything that forms on the buccal surface. So we have to understand, if you start seeing plaque very visible clearly, then it means that this particular patient has very, very poor oral hygiene and has accumulated too much of plaque. So now there are, I was telling you something uh, that uh, if someone has bad hygiene only, then you can identify the plaque. Now, how do you identify something uh, where is initially uh, in the initial states? So that's where what we call as the role of something called as detection of plaque comes. So how do we detect plaque? Visual examination, as I said. And the other way to identify plaque is by what we call as use of disclosing agent. So understand visual evaluation directly is very simple. A new plaque, someone, uh, what do you mean by new plaque? Someone who's got a brushing, uh, scaling and polishing done today and uh, they come to you after 36 hours, 48 hours for a follow-up or a checkup. And then uh, if you see their teeth, you won't be able to identify plaque unless they're really bad in hygiene. So this brand new plaque on the surface of the tooth is clear, non-detectable. You won't be able to see. Whereas an old plaque, someone in a, in a poor oral hygiene guy, it looks thick, dull, dingy, more like a matted fur kind of appearance. It's usually yellowish, usually takes a lot of pigmentation from the teeth surfaces or rather from the food. So if you have a new plaque, the best way to identify is you take a sharp periodontal sharp probe and then run it along the gingival margin. So you take a probe and run it along the gingival margin. And as you run it along the gingival margin, the tip of the probe, the tip of your probe catches some white substance. And this white substance is known as what we call as the, uh, this white substance is what we call as the dental plaque that is there. Okay. 
Uh, on the other hand, uh, the most foolproof way to identify plaque is what we call as use of something called a disclosing agent. And what are disclosing agents? Disclosing agents are nothing but uh, coloring liquids. Uh, so what you do is you take a dye. It's basically a dye. For example, I have this scrub. I'm, it's green. I'm not happy with this green. I want to make it blue. Either I buy a brand new blue one or I can dip it in a blue so that I can get a different color out of it. Exactly in similar manner. Or you dye your hair. So what you do is exactly in similar, I can dye my hair black, blue, pink, silver, gold, whatever I want, exactly. In the same way you can dye the plaque. So what you do, you use a dye or a pigmented and then drop it on the surface of the teeth. Ask the patient to rinse or you can apply it physically using the cotton hair brush, <clears throat> okay? And then ask the patient to rinse out. As the patient rinse out, then you can check the patient clinically. So when you check the patient clinically, what you'll see? If the plaque is usually old, uh, it's been long-standing, poor old hygiene, it starts appearing purple. And if it is brand new, it usually appears pink. Now, what the, why is it purple and pink? It's nothing but the thickness. So thicker the plaque, more the pigment gets absorbed, and that's why it looks more purple. Thinner the plaque, it looks more pinkish. That's the only thing. It's not related to anything else. Apart from plaque, uh, there are a few more terms what we'll have to learn through this session. Uh, one of those uh, is what we call as materia alba. Now, what's materia alba? Uh, it is the soft accumulation of bacterial and uh, uh, give me a break. One second. Joshi, Joshi. Uh, sorry for the interruption there. Yeah. So let's understand this. Uh, we are looking at uh, something called as materia alba. And what's materia alba? Uh, it's soft accumulation of bacterial and tissue cells and it is not organized and can be easily washed away. Now understand the difference. Plaque cannot be washed away with a three-way syringe, whereas materia alba can be easily washed away. So if I have a patient who's come, had his lunch and dinner, or lunch or dinner, probably even breakfast, and has not brushed his teeth, and has come to the clinic, uh, you have to understand that there are a lot of loose particles hanging in his mouth. Now, I cannot consider, or we as clinicians would not consider everything that's hanging in the mouth as plaque. So what we need to do is we need to ask him to rinse out or use a heavy three water spray, clean out everything that's stuck there and then ask him to spit. And then what uh, that gets spitted out, okay, is actually food debris. Apart from that, then you start seeing Something that's just lying on the surface of the teeth, but when you blow the air, it can it would start moving around. And that thing is known as what we call as materia alba. It can be easily washed away. Food debris can be rinsed out, but a materia alba is washed away with a three-way syringe. And a materia alba is the reason why it's known as alba is it's usually whitish in color. For example, someone had rice. So small piece of rice, etc. Just it's not forming, not at formed plaque, but it's just in the process of forming plaque and it appears white. And that's known as what we call as a materia alba. The next thing on the surface of the tooth, what you can see is calculus. Calculus, you learn uh, much more in detail about this. And this is known as what we call as calcified or calcifying uh, plaque. So let's come to the composition of plaque. So what's a uh, plaque made up of? Plaque, uh, the dental plaque is made up of a few things. Primarily is water, 98% is all water. The rest are made by various cells and the matrix. Now, what are the matrix? Matrix can have organic and inorganic. Let's see each of them in detail. Water forms around 80, 85% actually, in my opinion, it's around 90% of all the plaque is water. Now, where do I find this water? 50% of the water is within the cells and remaining 35% is in the matrix. And water is very, very important. Okay, without water, the plaque would dry out and then the tooth would not stay. The next thing is what we call as cells. Now, what are the cells? The most common cells what we see in any dental plaque is what we call as the plaque bacteria. Understand this, 600 different, minimum, 600 different species and different strains of those 600 species in the bacteria. Total number of bacteria at any given point is 2 into the power of 10 distributions, so you can start counting them. Okay, now look at this. 
the number of plaque bacteria that are present on the surface in the mouth is equal to that which is present in the lower colon. So you can understand the oral cavity is as clean or is as untidy as your lower colon. Okay, but this, uh, this bacteria is what is going to make all the difference. Apart from bacteria, what all we see in the oral cavity uh, on the in plaque? Neutrophils, WBCs, protozoa is mycoplasma. Now, from where are these uh, PMNs and WBCs coming, the neutrophils? They're coming from the GCF. You remember gingival clavicular fluid? So the fluid that comes out from the gingival device, the neutrophils uh, come out of that to fight the plaque organisms and then they stay off in that and sometimes they become a part of the plaque. So that's why, apart from bacterial cells, you'll also see PMNs and other WBCs in the dental plaque. Other WBCs, if they're present, that's gonna happen only if there's a bleeding. So if there is no gingival bleeding, someone is not bleeding from the gingival sulcus while brushing, etc., then you will not see any other WBC apart from neutrophils. Neutrophils can be present, but no other WBCs are present in the plant unless and until that site has bled in the course of time. So what's the matrix of the plaque? The plaque matrix uh, is uh, makes up 20 to 30 percent of the entire plaque, okay, by volume. Uh, and what it's composed of? It's primarily composed of carbohydrates. And what are those carbohydrates? The primary component of the carbohydrate is what we call dextrons and levons. What are dextrons and levons? Dextrons and levons are basically what we call as adhesive carbohydrates. So the glucose molecule is broken down by the initial colonizers like streptococcus. Now, as they break down the glucose molecules, they produce these things known as dextrons and levons. And what do these dextrons and levons do? They're like a fevicol. Okay, they form a layer, adhesive layer on the surface of the tooth. And this adhesive layer, what forms on the surface of the tooth, gives further attachment to further set of bacteria. That's why sugar, primarily glucose, is very, very dangerous because of the higher the sugar that you have in the mouth, higher the amount of dextrons, higher the amount of glue, what you call, you call it, as in this glue will then eventually attach a lot of bacteria. So imagine, uh, it's like you throw gum on the floor and then you throw balls or marbles on it. What's going to happen? Every ball that's going to be there is just going to get stuck there. Exactly the same thing happens in the mouth. So once you take a glucose-rich diet, the glucose is broken down to dextrons and levons and forms a layer on the surface of the tooth. And on this layer of the surface of the tooth, what happens is the plaque bacteria attach very, very easily. And once they attach to a glue, you understand how easy, difficult it is to take them out. And that's why a plaque is very difficult to dislodge unless you use a mechanical force like brushing or scaling as compared to removing the materia alba or any food debris. Understood? Okay. The next thing is, apart from that, there are obviously some polysaccharides, lipids, proteins, etc. The proteins primarily are coming from the saliva and the form of salivary glycoproteins. And some bacterial debris products, food, etc. also form a part of the organic content of the plaque. Apart from the organic content, you have a lot of inorganic content in the plaque and that's primarily calcium and phosphate. Okay. The same calcium and phosphate eventually uh, mineralizes and mineralizes the plaque and then we then call that term as what we call as calculus. Apart from that, you also have sodium chloride and fluoride which are basically present uh, as a part of the saliva. Now, what does this matrix do? The matrix does a few things. Uh, what does the matrix do? The number one and most important thing what the matrix does, it binds all the bacteria. I was telling you, giving you the example, it's like a glue. So it binds all the bacteria. Second, it's a source of nutrition. You have to understand dextrons and levons are derivatives of what we call as glucose. And the bacteria use this as their nutrition. So it's giving attachment and it's giving them food. What else do you need? Okay. Apart from that, you obviously uh, protect it from host defenses. Now you understand when you have a glue, for example, there's a glue on the floor. Now, do you actually, as an individual, go walk on the glue to pick up? No. The ball or whatever is there in case you need it very badly. No, you don't do that. Exactly in a similar manner, once you have that glue, it's very tough for the host defenses. What do you mean by host defenses? Immunoglobulins as well as neutrophils. So it's very tough for the neutrophils or the host defenses to go to the bacteria which are stuck onto the glue. So what's happening is the matrix is basically giving a lot of, lot of, lot of uh, defense uh, protection uh, to the bacteria which are attached onto it. Apart from that, it acts as a diffusion material for substances, so it helps in exchange of gases, food, nutrition, etc., for the bacteria to survive. 
Apart from that, we have to understand this also. It's like a storehouse also. What's happening now? The bacteria which are sitting on the plaque Pantrids are not innocent. They're not just lying there and sleeping. What are they doing? They're multiplying and they're releasing toxins and lipopolysaccharides. Now, as they release these toxins and lipopolysaccharides, they're the most virulent factors of the bacteria, toxins and lipopolysaccharides. Now, what happens? The lipopolysaccharides and toxins released by the bacteria, which are on this glue of all the matrix, it can keep on leaching it slowly. It is not going to give it one bomb. No, it's not going to do that. What's going to happen? The Toxins and the lipopolysaccharides keep on leaching from the matrix and then keep on irritating the host tissue on a continual basis. And that's why gingival and periodontal diseases are chronic in nature. They happen over a period of time. Secondly, even caries happens over a period of time. Thirdly, what happens is because these things are happening on a day-to-day -day basis, that's why it's very important that you instruct the patient to brush every day twice so that there is no accumulation of toxins or lipopolysaccharides in the matrix, and that's what you want. You want the matrix and everything to be removed, and the only way to remove that is a thorough brushing. So I hope you understand now why it's important for you, for you to instruct your patients to brush twice a day. The next thing uh, in plaque, uh, my dear friends, is what we call as, what are the various steps in formation of plaque? Uh, there are various steps in formation of plaque, uh, primarily four of them. Uh, Four of them. Please understand all these things are happening simultaneously. It is for our understanding that we have divided this into four different stages. Okay. First and foremost is something called as formation of a quiet pellicle. We'll learn about that. Next is initial colonization of plaque. Then there is growth and maturation of plaque. And then there's the maturation of the matrix. Now what's a quiet pellicle? Uh, we have to understand there's something called a congenital pellicle and there's something called an acquired pellicle. Okay, I want you to read about uh, pellicles, uh, or pellicles of the tooth. Uh, it is there in Karanza on the chapter uh, gingiva and uh, uh, junction epithelium. So I wanted to read what are the coatings on the surface of the teeth as it erupts into the mouth. Now, the term what we are speaking right now is acquired pellicle. It means it was not present on the tooth naturally, but it, the tooth has acquired it because it's present in the oral cavity. That's why the word acquired. It is acquired passively and not born with it natively. Okay, so what is an acquired pellicle? Acquired pellicle is defined as an amorphous. Understand the words, please. Very, very important. Okay, it's an amorphous, acellular, organic, tenacious, membranous layer that forms over the exposed surface of teeth and restoration or anything in the oral cavity. Amorphous means it doesn't have a very defined structure, like a crystal. It's not a crystal, it's amorphous, it's hazy. Acellular means it doesn't have any bacteria as of it. Organic tenacious means organic means it's derived by uh, it's made up of organic material. Tenacious means it's not very easy to remove. Membranous means it's continuous. There are no breaches there. It's a membranous layer that forms on the entire surface of the teeth or anything that's present in oral cavities, respirations, etc. Okay, so amorphous, acellular, organic, tenacious, membranous layer that forms on the exposed surfaces of the teeth and restoration. Amorphous means hazy, not structured. Acellular doesn't have any bacteria. Organic is basically uh, organic in nature. Tenacious means that it is very difficult to remove, doesn't come out easily. Membranous means it's continuous. So that's, remember these words. Now, what is it composed of? It's primarily composed of salivary glycoproteins. It doesn't have any bacteria. And the thickness of this is 0 0.1 to 0 0.8 millimeters. So let's understand this. Now, what happens here? How does this acquired pellicle form? Yeah. Let's do this and then go back to those slides. Now, the first step in formation of plaque is what we call as a formation of acquired pellicle. How does it form? Now, how did we study this? We studied it on patients who underwent scaling and then we evaluated them clinically okay, and microscopically. Okay, now what do we do now? Uh, you and you can do the study. So for example, you have a patient walking into your clinic today, you do the scaling and polishing and everything else, clean out the entire surface of the tooth. So I've done that today and I send the patient back. Now what happens on this clean tooth surface? Once I finish the scaling and discharge the patient from the clinic and send him out from the chair after collecting all the money and my fees are collected, then once I send this patient, what I'm doing? Okay, please understand, we are into treating patients and also earning money. So you have to take the bill. You cannot send the patient without collecting money. Okay, we are going to be in private practice. 
Okay, so so once we discharge the patient, what's going to happen? What are the set of events that happen on this clean tooth surface? The events happening on a clean tooth surface after scaling procedure, the first and foremost and the most important step is what we call as selective adsorption of salivary glycoproteins. So understand now, I have a tooth which is being cleaned and I send the patient out. So that tooth surface now is exposed to the entire saliva, GCF and everything else in the mouth. Now, what happens here is this tooth surface now, because it's exposed to the saliva, you all know that now saliva has got a lot of glycoproteins, okay, mucoproteins. Now these, these salivary glycoproteins go and attach onto the surface of the tooth. Okay, this first layer of attachment of salivary glycoproteins on the surface of the tooth is what we call as the first step in formation of acquired pellet. It's like this. Uh, you, take, uh, you take a glass or anything for that matter, shiny smooth surface glass, okay, and you dip it on, you know, in a glass of milk, tea, or even in a glue. So what happens? Once the excess is drained out, there is a thin layer that remains, isn't it? And that thin layer that remains is nothing but exactly like what you call as acquired pellicle. Okay, so that's the first step in formation of plaque is formation of acquired pellicle by selective adsorption of salivary glycoprotein. So let's get the sentence right. The first step in formation of plaque is the process of selective adsorption of salivary glycoproteins on the surface of the tooth, which is known as acquired pellicle. I hope you get this now. Okay, so now what is uh, the composition of uh, acquired pellicle? Salivary glycoproteins. No bacteria, it doesn't have cells. So you have to understand once the patient has undergone full scaling, it will take at least around 30 to 60 minutes for the first bacteria to form the tooth, attach onto the tooth. So in this time, zero to 60 minutes, for before the first bacteria attaches onto the tooth, you need a glycoprotein. If there's no glycoprotein on the surface of the tooth, then you're not going to get any bacteria because bacteria cannot attach to the enamel surface naked, okay? Uh, okay, what are the different types? Uh, it's the, so, uh, the glyco, the what we call the acquired pellicle, is uh, classified as a surf, uh, as surface unstained pellicle, uh, clear and which can be identified only with the uh, disclosing agent. It's usually clear and pale. Then there's something called surface stained pellicle, which is the surface pellicle. You have to understand, zero point one mm is surface unstained pellicle. There is zero, anything that's more than 0.1 up to 0.5 is surface stain pellicle, which can take up the color, okay? And then there is subsurface pellicle, which is the what, all the pellicle that goes between in, on your enamel grooves, root grooves, etc. okay? So what does this acquired pellicle do? Acquired pellicle does two, the most important thing is it prevents desiccation of the surface of the tooth. And what is the meaning of desiccation? You take something, put it in water, and you allow it to dry. Okay, there is still some moisture on the surface. Okay, it's dry. On the other hand, when you suck out all the moisture from the surface of the tooth, what you get or on any surface is known as desiccation. Prevention of, the, if a tooth gets desiccated, the first thing that, the eventual thing what will happen is it'll crack because moisture on the surface of the tooth holds the tooth's enamel intact. It's like, imagine a chalk. Chalk can be easily broken, but if you put a chalk in a glue and then try and break it, it's going to take that much more time. So what? Uh, the acquired pellicle does, it prevents desiccation of the surface of the tooth. It prevents acid attack because it's a layer, it prevents acid attack, but it also at the same time gives attachment to the microorganisms and it also provides what we call a non-shedding surface because it's like a glue, it cannot be removed, okay? And because it's non-shedding, the ones the bacteria attach, they will not go. So if you have the surface of the tooth, you have the pellicle, it cannot be removed, it's a non-shedding surface. So if this is a bacteria and comes and attaches onto it, it will just stay there, it's just not going to go away. Okay, so that's the function of your acquired pellicle. It prevents desiccation of the tooth, attaches microorganisms, to a certain extent protects from acid attack. But in the long run, the amount of acids that get produced by the bacteria are so large that this function does not exist anymore. And it creates a non-shedding surface for the bacteria. So how does the formation of acquired pellicle, as I told you, by happening of the uh, adsorption of saliva glycoprotein? And how does this adsorption happen? It happens by what we call as three factors, by the application of electrostatic forces, by the application of van der Waals forces and hydrophobic forces. So what we have here is a clean enamel surface. Uh, 
And on that enamel surface, which is negatively charged, we have to understand the surface of the tooth is a net negative charge. It's always negative in nature. Whereas the salivary glycoproteins are positive in charge. Okay, so when a positive and a negative come in contact, then this forms what we call the first layer of the on the surface of the tooth after scaling, and that is what we call the acquired pellicle. So this red line that you see here on the extreme right side of the screen is nothing but the acquired pellicle. There's no gap there on the, between the enamel and this one. It's actually closely attached onto the enamel layer, and that happens by acrostatic forces, Van der Waals forces, or even hydrophobic forces. So I hope now that uh, you got how the formation of acquired pellicle happens. So we'll close this session right now here, and then we are going to come back and do the next part of what we call as the uh, bacterial colonization. How does it happen? A various plaque hypothesis and uh, growth maturation specificity of the plaque, etc. Okay. So we close the first session here at what we call as formation of acquired pellicle. So let's just go back and redefine the most important part of this topic. That is the definition of plaque. It's a highly variable, but specific structural entity resulting from the colonization and growth of microorganisms of various species and strains, which are embedded in an extracellular matrix. Thank you so much. Uh, we will save this as the first part of the two or three session topic for you. Okay. Thank you. Stop.